Planet Shakers is a global ministry that has grown from a small youth conference in Australia to now impacting every continent of the world. Through its church, awakenings, music tours and other ministries, Planet Shakers has a mandate to empower generations to win generations. He says, I value you so much that I'm going to bankrupt heaven and send the most precious thing that I have, my son. When we give weight to, give thanks for, or cheer on, there is something in operation far greater than respect. What kind of view do you have? Do you see a month down the road? Maybe you plan a year ahead. What about 10 years? Our God is a generational God whose promises extend way beyond the limited timeframes that we like to impose. What would happen if every Christian thought in the terms of multiple generations, just like God does? How would your choices be different if you decided to look generationally? Whether given to us directly or indirectly through our forefathers, we each must choose whether or not we'll continue to honour and believe His promises. Honour is a connective tissue between generations. It's what propels His promise to be outworked in its fullness. I'm Russell Evans, and I want to shake the planet. Imagine if I gave you a key that would release heaven 
to your earth, to see family, finances, friendships blessed, a life full of miracles, healings and breakthroughs, to see generational blessing, to receive and release heavenly inheritance, to have the key for every need and situation in life. This key of honour is amazing because it's the currency of heaven. Hmm. What is a currency? A currency is a medium of exchange. So if you go shopping and you know, men and women shop differently. You know, my wife says to me, let's go shopping. I think marathon. <laughs> you know, remember one time she's like, let's go get some jeans. I'm like, oh no. Any smart shop owner should create television space, a lounge space, some drinks and some food for all the men. I just think that'd be a great business right there. And all the men are clapping and all the women are saying, stop that in Jesus' name. <laughs> well, you know, but to buy something, you need a currency to exchange it. If I go into a shop and I say, hey, I like that jacket and I don't exchange it for currency and I walk out, I get arrested. Sometimes we come to God and we don't come with honour and we don't come with faith and we wonder why we're not bringing heaven to earth. We come and ask, but we don't believe. Hmm. So honour is this key. It's the culture of the kingdom. What is a kingdom? It's a king's domain, the way the king operates. And see, honour gets quoted a lot in our society and, and most times it's quoted from a hierarchical point of view and, and it's like, it's from the point of view, you gotta honour your parents and I believe in honouring your parents because a house that doesn't honour their parents is a house that's in dishonour and there's no order in the house. So I believe in honouring parents. We gotta honour our leaders. I believe in honouring leaders. I, I, I believe in that. I, I believe that's what we should do. I, I believe in honouring our teachers and I believe in honouring those who God has put over us because honour isn't earned, it's actually appointed. We think, you know, you have to earn, no, respect you earn, honour is appointed. Hmm. The Bible says, that those who God has put over authority has been in your life has been appointed by Him. Hmm. To esteem, to merit, to have weight to, to value. So I believe in honouring people who, who are above you, who are your leaders, I believe in that. But many times we've looked at honour through a hierarchical point of view, but God doesn't look at honour through a hierarchy. Because if you look at through that view, Honour must start with the kid or the child or the, or the employee. But actually, honour starts with the leader, the father, the boss. Hmm. I see people say, well, I wanna have a culture of honour in my workplace. Well, boss, you'd start it. Because where did honour start? Did it start with the son or did it start with the father? It started with the father by sending his son because he valued you and I so much. He says, I value you so much that I'm going to bankrupt heaven and send the most precious thing that I have, my son, to die upon the cross for you. He says, I value your life that I'm going to give you what is precious to me and to take away your sin. So he sends his son to die upon the cross. Where did honour start? It started with the father. Look at the prodigal son story. Son comes to his dad and says, hey, dad, I want my inheritance. And he gives him his inheritance. He goes off and wastes his inheritance and the father, but the Bible says, is waiting every day for the son. And the Bible says that the son comes to his senses and he comes back and he thinks, even the servants have a better life that I'm having at my father's house than I'm having here. So he comes away home and the father runs and embrace him. You never hear the father say, you wicked, naughty son. What does the father do? He says, welcome, son. And the son says, I'm not worthy. See, again, the son then comes into a mindset and saying, hey, I honour you, dad. You are the father of this house. So I honour you. I, I come under you. I value you. I value this house. He came in repentance. He came with honour. But the father never pointed his finger at the son. What did he do? He said, get me a ring. And he gets him a ring. What does a ring signify? It signifies authority. 
He says, I'm going to honour you, son. Even though you don't deserve it, I'm going to honour you because honour starts with the father. And so he gives him a ring and he says, give him a robe and give him sandals. And, and he says, get the fatted calf. I have a thought about the fatted calf. Notice he doesn't say, get the calf. I reckon the day that the son left, the father says, get a calf ready. Because I'm waiting for him to come home. I'm, I'm ready. I, get it ready. Make sure... I, I got a friend of mine, he, he's, he's an Italian, he likes food. He has a, and a ministry for hospitality and every year he puts on this conference and all we do is eat. <laughs> we have some sermons, but mostly it's eating. <laughs> and I remember we were eating this lamb and any vegans here, sorry about this, but we are in Texas. Um, <laughs> and uh, we started, we we're eating this lamb and I said, this lamb is amazing. He goes, let me tell you about the lamb. I'm like, well, tell me about the lamb. He said, last year at last conference, we got this lamb and we hand fed it and we got it all prepared for this meal. And he got this lamb ready and it was the best lamb I've ever eaten. I felt actually sorry for the lamb while I was eating him. Um, but it, what did he do? He got it prepared. Why? Because he honoured us. The father said, get the fatted calf. I reckon he was getting it ready for the son because honour always starts from the head. Hmm. But then, you see, what honour isn't? I see people talk about honour and they, they go, well, I honoured them, but they didn't honour me back. That's not honour. That's manipulation. You're giving something to get something. That's not honour. Honour doesn't look for anything in return. Husband, <laughs> honour your wife. What, well, she didn't do this for me, so I'm leaving the marriage. No, that's not honour. You're doing something to get something. Wife, honour the husband. Children, honour the parents. It, it, where there is a place where there's honour in the house, there's peace in the house. Generational blessing comes when there's honour. to worship I 
The atmosphere changes when generations unite. When we give weight to, give thanks for, or cheer on, there is something in operation far greater than respect. Where honour is, heaven is invited into the room. Mothers and fathers who nurture the gift in a child call out the intricate God-shaped features, treasure that lay ready for retrieval. Children who feel unquestioned love from the ones given stewardship over their hearts receive the view of possibility. They receive the view of an apprentice hopeful of becoming like the heroes that surround them. Both generations stand in awe of the ones who precede parent and child. Invaluable, unpurchasable wisdom and revelation ready to be consumed by those taking a mantle into generations they won't exist to reach. Every detail has been celebrated, past, present, and future. They have received honor's reward, generations. You look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there's Abraham, and, and, and God says to Abraham, hey, Abraham, see the stars in the sky, that's your inheritance. <laughs> and Abraham goes, awesome. My wife's pretty old and so am I. But what did they do? They honored God by becoming intimate and they eventually produced Isaac, one son of the promise. It wasn't billions of stars, it was one son. What did Isaac do? He honored the promise that was on Abraham and produced two sons of the promise. What did Jacob do? He honored the promise that was on Isaac who honored the promise that was on Abraham and produced 12 sons of the promise. Now, what does the Bible say? We are of the seed of Abraham and his blessing rests on us. Now there's billions and billions of children of the promise. What kept it going generationally? The honoring of what God had said to Abraham. Hmm. A third generation preacher. A preacher honored God by going and sharing with, to my grandpa, my grandfather. My grandfather then felt called of God to go to India as a missionary from Wales. My grandma, who got saved in a meeting by a guy called Smith Wigglesworth, gets on fire for God. She, at the age of 22, hops on a boat, called by God to India, single young lady, single young Welshman, and they meet in, in India and they fall in love. They get married and they're there for five years and they got a passioning, burning desire to win India. And so there they are, and, and my, they have one pe person who gets saved in five years, not great growth. <laughs> what kept them going through the dark times is they valued what God said. Noah, for 120 years, preached, and no one got saved. No one joined his boat. No one hopped on the Royal Caribbean Noah. But what kept Noah going? Honoring what God said. Valuing what God said over what man says. What situations say. Hmm. I say now, you know, Noah would never get invited to our churches to preach because he just had a family church. He wouldn't invite to my conference. I'd go, well, what have you ever built? An ark? Well, great. But now, if we look in hindsight, Noah's the second greatest leader of all time. You go, how do you get that? Well, Jesus is the greatest because he saved our soul. But Noah is the second greatest because without Noah, there's no one to save. <laughs> what kept him going? What kept my grandparents going? With one decision, my dad just recently went to India to dedicate the church that my grandparents started. And as he was coming into the church, new church building, this elderly lady ran to his feet and she began to grab his feet and she wept on his feet and she began to say, beautiful feet, beautiful feet. 
She was the first person ever to give her life to Jesus under my grandparents' ministry. <laughs> then my, my father, as I said, became this famous preacher. I, I, I didn't want to be a preacher because of all this history. How could I ever be anything great? I remember when my grandma was 87 years of age and she was dying. They said she was in a coma and they said she's not gonna make it through the night. And we went into her room and we started singing around her bed a song called I Can Feel the Power of Jesus All Over Me. And my grandma, as we're singing, opens her eyes and smiles. So we stopped singing. She goes back down and I said to my cousin, sing again, man. And she, <laughs> third time, she, we say goodbye to her, don't think she's gonna be alive in the morning. In the morning, she's sitting on the side of her bed saying, where's my breakfast? <laughs> a, few, a few days later, my grandfather, my mother and myself are going up to my grandma's room and he said, it's time for grandma to go home and be with Jesus. So we go into her room and he says, it's time for you to go home. We've fought the fight, we've kept the faith, we've served Jesus. Now we've got generations of serving Jesus. And so we said this prayer around her bed and then she opens her eyes and starts saying goodbye to all the family. Goodbye, Andrew. Goodbye, David. Goodbye, Fred. She gets to me, goodbye, Russell. And I'm crying. We cry, as Evans, as we cry. Some, some men don't cry. They're usually single. <laughs> I don't cry, I'm a man. Yeah, you're single. <laughs> Women like soft hearts. They like strong, but they like soft hearts. So, so in worship, even just poke yourself in the eye and she'll see you, sir. And you have tears running down like the spiritual man of God. Come. <laughs> tears running down my face. I said, thank you, Grandma. I'll see you in heaven. Planet Shaker's music, which I started, gets sung by millions of people all over the world. Millions. Our church is the fastest growing church in Australian history from zero to 10,000 in 10 years. What God is doing astounds me. I've spoken to 250,000 people in one time. I've seen miracles like you wouldn't believe. And I go, God, how did that happen? When I carried my grandma's coffin and tears were running down my face, when I, I remembered the last words I said to grandma. I said, every time I do something, it's because you honoured Jesus and I'm honouring what Jesus did in you. And we carried the coffin and buried her. And See, my grandma's life is still speaking because it started by a preacher honouring, valuing what God said and went and told somebody. A, a, a grandfather who got full with God went to India, went to Papua New Guinea and then a father, then a then a grandson, and, and now generations later and millions of people later, the impact has been global. Why? Because we're anything good? No, I was an insecure pastor's kid who thought I couldn't do anything, but one day I decided to honour what God said and instead of what the devil said. And because of that, I valued what he said and the impact. And here's the deal. God's no respecter of people. He's just looking for people to value what he says and value what he does and release heaven on earth. I'm gonna pray right now and I'm gonna pray for a spirit of wisdom and understanding and that we'd get this. I wanna encourage you to get the book because there's a lot more I could say on it. But I really believe it's the key to unlock heaven. Father, right now, I thank you for the anointing that's in this place, the incredible honour that's in this place. And Father, I pray that, that we would be people who honour your word. We honour people. We, we honour the things that you would say. Lord, there's generational blessing here. There's power here. There's presence here. Father, we want to honour You. We value what You have to say. And we respond to You. Take our lives. Use our lives to make a difference on this earth. In Jesus' name.
We're so glad you could join us today. Wherever you are watching all around the world, be favoured, be blessed, and may God prosper you in everything you do. In this episode, I talked about how honour is the key that unlocks faith, which is the currency of heaven. God's looking for people who value what He says, what He does, and what He sees. He's looking for people who honour Him so He can flow through them. We would love to invite you to honour what Jesus has done on the cross for you. He died, He rose again just for you. And by honouring this incredible act of love and receiving Him into your life, He can revolutionise you forever.